It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The latest crisis spot for the global economy appears to be Italy. This week, the world's oldest bank, Monte de Paschi di Siena, had to be rescued. Further, the Eurozone's recent stress test on banks showed worrying signs of the European financial crisis of 2011 still lingering five years later. Meanwhile, Latin America passed through an important period of economic growth between 2000 and 2015, but it is now facing new economic difficulties in countries such as Brazil and Venezuela, Argentina. The IMF, which for a long time served as the world's main enforcer of neoliberalism, last month signaled that neoliberalism might just be oversold. Apparently, neoliberalism has resulted in greater inequality and lower economic growth. Well, we are going to talk about all of this and much more with our very special guest here in our studio, Mark Weisbrot. Mark is the author of the recently published book, Failed, What the Experts Got Wrong About the Global Economy. Mark is the co-director of the Center for Economic Policy Research and is the president of Just Foreign Policy. He's also a syndicated columnist. Mark, I thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Sharmini. Great to be with you. So, Mark, I thought we would tackle the, your book in three segments. We'll take up Europe, and then in the second segment, let's do the IMF. And in the third segment, let's take up Latin America. Sure. Okay. So let's start with Europe first. Now, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, Italy is going through a huge uh, crisis, a banking crisis, and a long-term, actually a six-year um, recession. And uh, coming out of it is going to be difficult. What can we learn from this experience of uh, Italy? Now, I know back in 2011, according to your book, you were still writing about the potential crisis Italy is going to face. Um, so what did the European Union do to Italy to, uh, to make sure that it would not come out of this recession? Well, the problem of Italy is the problem of the Eurozone. And it's not just these structural problems, you know, people talk about having a common currency in countries that really may not have the qualifications to have that common currency. That is, they may not have, uh, they have different rates of productivity growth, or they have other things that would put them out of whack, or they don't have a common fiscal policy to go with having a common monetary policy. And these, these things are true, you know, and economists point this out. But I think, and, and one of the reasons why this is becoming such an issue everywhere, I mean, you had Brexit, which is not, you know, the, the people voted to leave the European Union in the UK, which is not even a member of the Eurozone. It's kind of ironic. They're not suffering the way Italy and Spain and Portugal and Greece have suffered from, you know, having, being part of this uh, failed currency union. And yet they voted to leave too, because these are questions of democracy and national sovereignty over economic policy. So I guess the, the most basic problem in the Eurozone and what makes it a special case compared to problems in other places in the world, uh, the problems you mentioned in Latin America, is that they gave away their control over the most important economic policies that any government can have. And they gave it to the wrong people. <laughs> they gave it to people who really didn't have their best interests at heart. And when I mean the most important economic policies, I'm talking about, well, first, your uh, monetary policy, your interest rates and money supply, the things that the Federal Reserve decides for us here in the US. Well, the European Central Bank is deciding that for the European and, you know, for the Eurozone, for the 19 countries in the Eurozone. And, you know, that is a very dangerous situation. And that's just one part of it. Of course, exchange rate. How does this manifest itself uh, when, when you say it has given up uh, control? Um, we know that in years gone, uh, in the past, before the Eurozone, uh, countries like Italy and Greece, these were you know, robust economic uh, uh, countries in Spain as well. 
Um, so what happened? What did they give up control of exactly? Well, when you join this currency union, you adopt this single currency. So immediately you, you don't have the ability to use your currency, your exchange rate, you know, between your currency and other currencies in the world as a policy choice. That's kind of important right there because, for example, if you're running a trade deficit, one of the ways to reduce that is to devalue your currency and then your imports will go down because they become more expensive and your exports will increase because they become cheaper. So that's one tool of economic policy that you automatically don't have when you don't have your own currency. And of course that was a, a problem too because you had Germany still running these big uh, trade surpluses and then other countries were running deficits and then they, they ran into trouble uh, from that. But then you have uh, even more importantly, uh, you have a central bank that you don't control. And the central bank is very important when you run into trouble. You know, in Greece, for example, the European Central Bank did something that probably no central bank has ever done in the history of central banking. They, they actually, uh, in order to try to force the Greeks to vote the way they wanted in the referendum on the austerity policies, they actually, and then, you know, after they voted no, they shut down uh, the Greek banking system. They caused a deep financial uh, crisis deliberately. Uh, to threaten, intimidate, and, and punish uh, the Greek people for not accepting the decisions of the uh, so-called Troika, and also I would add the, Europe, the, the finance, um, the Eurogroup of finance ministers. So this is what they did. And so these countries, Greece and Spain and Portugal and Ireland, they found that they not only lost control over their exchange rate policy, their monetary policy and interest rates, but when they got into trouble, they lost control over their fiscal policy, their budget policy as well, was, uh, was being dictated by these unaccountable, unelected authorities. And I think that's where the democracy and national sovereignty questions are so paramount. In theory, it wouldn't be such a bad thing to form a currency union uh, I mean, the United States has one currency for all of the United States. We're economically integrated, okay? So, and, and you could conceivably do that with a group of countries that was economically integrating, not, you know, at a, a steady pace as, as Europe was. But you can't have it with authorities that have a whole different agenda. And that's the thing I wrote about that I think has not been emphasized enough, that is, these European authorities, the European Central Bank, the uh, European Commission, the Eurogroup of Finance Ministers, uh, which as Yanis Varoufakis, the former finance minister of Greece always points out, is not even a legitimate group. There's no legal uh, basis for it. And, and then of course the IMF was brought in as well. So that's the four of them. They, they had a political agenda. They wanted to change Europe in a way that would diminish the social and economic uh, protections that they have. And this isn't a conspiracy theory. You can see this. There are hundreds of pages of documents showing uh, that they wanted to cut healthcare spending, they wanted to cut pension spending, they wanted to reduce the bargaining power of labor. In June, you had all these strikes and protests in France. That's what that was about. The uh, government uh, tried to implement a policy which uh, basically made labor's, uh, reduced labor's bargaining power by making it harder for them to bargain in a sector uh, rather than individually against companies. So this was, and this was done in Spain as well. So they had all of these uh, changes that they wanted to make that would, you know, redistribute income upward, obviously, and uh, make Europe a lot more like the United States, a much smaller welfare state uh, and much reduced uh, social and economic uh, protections. 
Mark, um, what's interesting about some of the countries you mentioned is uh, Greece, for example. France has a socialist government. Greece has Syriza. Um, now, even uh, if we look at Italy, you know, we finally got rid of Berlusconi, and and we have a, a, a government that came to power as a result of having. Um, you know, uh, criticize the agenda of Berlusconi and, and corporate sector. However, they're highly unsuc unsuccessful in trying to change the uh, psyche of how uh, Eurozone is governed and their role in it. Why? Well, it is complicated, and that's why I say it is kind of a special case, mm -hmm. because you know, something like this wouldn't happen in the United States, for example, and it is really different. They have twice the unemployment rate that we have right now because of these terrible economic policies. Here, you know, even if Mitt Romney had been elected in 2012, he wouldn't have done the kinds of things that you see in Europe. He would have wanted to get reelected. And that's why I say the democracy question is so important because they're stuck in this thing. They, they really would have to leave the euro to fix these things uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time. And you advocate that in the book, that in well, countries I, like Greece, you know, they might have been better off uh, leaving the Eurozone, but is that feasible? I mean, obviously, these left governments didn't think that they could do it and manage it, so is that a reality? Yeah, I don't really say they should leave. I mean, I, I do say, and I think a lot of economists would agree, that Greece, for example, would have been much better off today if they had left back in 2010 when they were operating under their first uh, IMF uh, agreement that everybody at the time knew was just going to make things worse, and it did, and worse and worse, and, you know, seven years of depression already. So you wouldn't have had that if they left. And that you can see by just looking at other financial crises uh, in the last, uh, you know, 20 years or more that, that involved devaluations, you know, because nobody suffers that long, you know. You can look at the Asian financial crisis, you can look at what happened in Argentina, and yeah, you, you do, things do get worse uh, before they get better, but in Argentina it was just a few months, and then they, re they recovered very rapidly. So they're really stuck, you know. Uh, you know, you have this in the United States, you sometimes the Obama administration will, and people who support it will claim that they saved us from a Great Depression. Well, that's not exactly true. You, you don't get a, a Great Depression even from the bursting of a $8 trillion housing bubble like we had in the United States. You get it from repeatedly doing the wrong things over years at a time. That's what they're doing. So why don't they leave is the question, right? Uh, and th that's complicated because it's, it's political and it also has to do with not understanding the economics. I mean, that's one of the reasons I wrote this book was because I see, you know, all over the world, you see policy decisions that are made not only because uh, the people making decisions have some combination of uh, misunderstandings and bad intent, okay? They believe some of what they're doing and some of they're doing for bad reasons like in the Eurozone, but also because people don't really understand uh, economic policy as much as they need to. And I think if they really understood what the Eurozone was doing to them, yeah, they would, uh, there would be a basis for these governments to leave, a popular basis for them to One leave. One thing about the popular movements uh, that was behind Syriza and now the unity government in Greece and the prolonged crisis, uh, economic crisis that they have been in, they have a highly educated class of people now who can, ordinary people, who can actually talk about how the economy is impacting on them. And when we were there in, in Greece last year and then this year, uh, always uh, hardened to find out how much they can talk about what's happening no, that's um, right. day to day in the banking system or to their mortgages or what's happening as a result of cutbacks and privatizations and so on. Um, so it is creating a, a better educated working class and uh, unemployed youth uh, that are also coming into the fold of these protests. Uh, and, but they knew when they voted uh, no to the referendum in Greece, the people knew what they were voting for might mean that they might be leaving the uh, Eurozone. Well, it's not clear. I mean, that was June 5th, I think, of last year, and the people voted overwhelmingly, 61%, uh, to reject the latest austerity package from the European authorities. 
But they didn't vote to leave uh, the euro. They thought the government would go back and the European authorities would make some concessions. So you didn't have that. Now, I think, you know, it's hard to say. I, I always hesitate to judge people in these situations. A very tough choice for Syriza in some ways. Um, I think they should have gone in and say, you know, we're not going to accept it, and then let the, the European authorities push them out. But they, they never really were going to do that. And I think once the German government and its allies and the whole European quartet realized they were never going to leave, they just crushed them. And, uh, you know, even President Obama was quite worried about Europe for a while. And he was putting pressure, I think, uh, there was a lot of indications that this government was putting pressure on the Germans not to push them out of the euro. But once he realized that they were never going to leave, then he didn't uh, bother saying anything either that would pressure them. So that they they had I believe they had some bargaining power but they never they never used it. So we don't know what would have happened if they would have actually said no. Uh, it's possible they they that they they would have made some concessions. Uh, Mark the decision of the British people to follow through with the Brexit um, uh, was profound. Um, what does this mean for Europe now? And also if you could comment on the fact that whether uh, UK maintained any of their national sovereignty and their ability to, um, to have more control over their economic policy as a result of not uh, being a part of the Euro? Well, I think there's some because Remember, they're not in the Eurozone. So they did have, and this helped them a lot with their recovery. They had their own central bank and they used monetary policy and quantitative easing like you know the Federal Reserve did here uh, much earlier than they did in, in the Eurozone. And so they, their unemployment rate is lower. They are much lower than the, than the Eurozone. And they did do better but not as, of course, as well as they, they could, not nearly as well as they could or should have. And uh, so, but on the other hand, they're still part of this European Union, and the European Union also has a neoliberal project. It's, you know, it's, they still are, they have one, for one, they have this uh, fiscal pact uh, that is, agrees that governments will have to reduce uh, spending, for example, and keep their, uh, from even from current levels today, and keep their, uh, their deficits below a certain level. And, the, you know, the UK is, is part of that too. Now, I wish I could say that people voted for Brexit for all those right reasons, but they didn't. It was a demagogic, anti-immigrant and racist campaign. But nonetheless, uh, you know, it is, it is related to the troubles of the rest of the the whole European Union and the Eurozone because there is still this European, this neoliberal project within the European Union that does, uh, it hurts the UK as well. Now, um, what options are there? There are uh, some changes in Europe. You see um, with Syriza in power, maybe the situation in uh, France, you know, turning in you know, if they would actually govern with their platform, the Socialist Party of France, um, you have the possibility uh, of a left word shift in places like uh, um, Spain and, and Portugal, of course. Now, there is a shift going on in Europe. Um, do you think that would help in terms of setting better economic policy for, the, uh, for Europe uh, that would benefit ordinary people? Well, I think, I mean, it is going in that direction. What happened is the, the center-left kind of collapsed because, it, that's because they supported the austerity. So, for example, in Greece, you had the Socialist Party of Greece, PASOK, which got over 40% of the vote for 40 years. And then they had something like four or five in the last election. So uh, that's uh, because they supported the austerity. Now, in that country, uh, of course, most of their support went to Syriza. They went to the left. And so, uh, but it doesn't always go that way. It can go, uh, in France, a lot of it is going uh, to the right, okay? So it depends. In Spain, a lot of it went to Podemos, the left party. 
That is, uh, the center left lost its support uh, to the left, uh, not to the right. So that they're moving uh, forward some. Podemos is the third largest party, something that just created a couple of years ago, and it's a left party is actually, they had a coalition in the last election with uh, Izquierda Unida, the uh, United Left. And so, uh, so it really depends where it goes at the national level. Uh, it depends what kind of leadership you have. You know, I think Spain and, and Greece both had some good leadership on the left that was able to pull the disaffected voters from the center left uh, over to the left. Uh, I think it's going to have to change like that because the Eurozone is so structurally, uh, I want to say corrupt, but it's, it's, it's as much an ideological and a power corruption as it is the influence of the big banks, for example. It's, it's really so structurally neoliberal that uh, you're going to have to have better governments uh, with, in, the, in the individual countries that can really either leave or, or force it to be a different project. And finally, why is it in the interest of the uh, Draghi's uh, of the world or the neoliberal uh, champions in Europe, why is it in their interest to push back uh, you know, the ordinary people and the basic uh, economic rights that they should be allowed to the point that it is threatening the Eurozone itself? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's a complicated question because it isn't just the interest, for example, the big banks. I mean, they lost a lot. They took a 50 percent uh, haircut, they, you know, in Greece, for example, that they could have avoided. Uh, and if they had just made some uh, concessions and restructured the debt back in 2009, it would have taken very little money and they wouldn't have had a, they lose money too in this, you know, the stock market in, in, in Europe is way down. So it's not like uh, the elite and the richest people in Europe are really benefiting from this terrible recovery uh, as compared to the recovery we had in the United States. And I think it's because uh, for both their own material interests, but also uh, their own ideological uh, interests, they really want a different kind of Europe. They don't like the social Europe that people created over decades of struggle for a welfare state, for public pensions, for universal health care, for unemployment insurance and other job protection. They can't take all that away. I mean, uh, but they're hacking away as much as they can because they, uh, they have a whole set of arguments for why this is going to eventually produce something uh, better. And some of these things they actually believe, and some of them they're doing because they have big corporations and banks that just want them. All right, Mark, I thank you so much for joining us. And let's continue talking about, in our next segment, um, the role of the IMF in terms of moderating and facilitating the global economy. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.